Let's turn back tonight to this prayer of Paul's at the end of Ephesians 3. God willing, this will be the last time we'll turn to it tonight. But what a great prayer it is, and we want to try to bring it to a completion. Thank you for coming. It's a, a wet old night, but the good news is it's only to rain, I think, until the middle of April. So don't worry about that. It will change sooner or later. But Ephesians chapter 3 and let's pick up our reading at verse 14. Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. God will bless this reading of his word. We've been thinking about this prayer for a few weeks now, and we have really divided it into three. We noted the important part that Paul had uh, in all of this here regarding the mystery and, of course, the instruction Paul gave regarding all of this and the intercession Paul made regarding all of this. And of course, this prayer, it's a very important prayer. There are two prayers thus far in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, we've already noted, where Paul prays for the believers that they might be enlightened. But when we come to Ephesians 3, it's a different prayer because Paul is now praying that these believers might be Enabled, In other words, praying that by the power of God within them, they might be enabled to live victorious Christian lives. And what a great prayer this is. We've seen Paul's attitude in prayer, the posture that he embraces. And then we began to think about the person he addresses. But also we noted the content of this prayer because what a tremendous prayer this is. And I said to you, that there were four things that Paul was going to pray for. And of course, as he prays, this prayer is not just a general prayer, it's a specific prayer, and it's a spiritual prayer because he wants that these people would be touched by the power of God. First thing he prayed for, he prayed that they might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, as far as the believer in Christ is concerned, he needs or she needs the enabling of the Holy Spirit if they're going to live a victorious Christian lives. We can't afford as believers in these closing days of grace just to limp along, not doing anything but living life without any real purpose or commitment. It is so essential that empowered by the Holy Spirit, we live as we ought to live. And when Paul says here for these believers that they might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, he's speaking about the real me, the real you. It's the soul part of us. And of course, though, it's right and there's nothing wrong with looking after the external and keeping fit and watching over your body and all of those other things. Paul's not concerned about that because the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. And therefore, you and I must take heed to the inner man, and we must seek as best as we can to walk with God and in that way live a spirit-empowered and a spirit-controlled life. Second thing he prays for, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Of course, what is Paul is saying? He's not saying that these people might 
get saved. He's talking about people who are already saved, and he's praying that they might be Christians whose personal relationship with Jesus Christ might deepen. The word dwell, as I said last time, simply means to settle down and to feel at home. So Paul's speaking about the Spirit of God coming, taking a permanent residence in the heart of the believer. And he wants them in their ongoing walk with God to deepen their faith and to get to the stage where the Lord Jesus Christ might have every single part of them. Do you know, beloved, that's a tremendous challenge because it's possible to be a Christian and yet really not know much of the Lord's presence with us. We say he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives in me. And the evidence of Christ living in us should be Christ living his life through us. And in that way, people will know we have been to Jesus. We come tonight to the third thing. We're going to do these final two tonight. And the third thing is this. He prays that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now hopefully by now we can see where Paul is going with this prayer. I said when we started the prayer it was almost as if Paul was using building blocks to say one thing and then another thing, another thing, and another thing until it would get to the stage where he would conclude everything with a great crescendo leading to the glory of God. And Paul is stressing here this. The more you and I are renewed in the inner man, and the more that you and I experience the indwelling of Christ in our lives, then the more rooted and grounded we become in love. You see, so much so that the Lord Jesus Christ who indwells us begins to exude. That simply means that the love of Christ is a love that should be not only in our hearts, but then spilling over, spilling over into the hearts and the lives of others. Now that can only happen whenever you and I continually yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Now look at what he says here for a moment, because he uses two terms that are very important. Firstly, there's the term rooted. And that term is taken from the word of agriculture. You'll know from your reading of Paul's epistles that sometimes in order to use an illustration, he plucks something from the word of agriculture, sometimes from the world of architecture, and he uses these terms in order to explain what it is that he's trying to say. And here he talks about a term, rooted. You see, a tree, a tree that is going to grow and flourish must have deep roots going down into the soil or it will not grow. I may have told you this story before, and forgive me if I have done, but I remember in my first church in Kilray, remember one night Christine and I lying in bed, and boy, there was a rough storm. And the storm just kept going and going throughout the hours of the night until it simply settled down coming into the morning time. As we went down to church and as I was in to park my car where I normally parked it, there was a young tree lying uprooted. And that tree was not a little shrub by any means. These were tall, tall trees that had been put in at the side of the church building but there's no root. And when the storms came that night, it just ripped it up out of the ground. And there it was lying right across my car park space. I couldn't understand why it couldn't have fell somewhere else. But there it was lying and rooted right up out of the ground. And the tree was so high 
and the roots were so short. Now, do you see where I'm coming from and do you see where Paul is coming from? Child of God, we need to be rooted in the word of God and we need to be rooted in the love of God. You say, why? Well, think about what the hymn writer says. When the storms of life are raging, tempest wild on sea and land, I will seek a place of refuge in the shadow of God's hand. He will hide me. He will hide me where no harm can ever betide me. He will hide me, safely hide me in the shadow of his hand. Now the truth is, though sometimes we don't want to admit it, lest somebody thinks that we're not as spiritual as they think we are. Sometimes when the storms of life are raging, our roots are not far enough down for us to be able to take the storm with its full force. But if you and I are going to be strong and we're going to flourish, we need to be well rooted in our faith. And we need to be well rooted in the word of God. You see, sometimes people don't understand the importance of God's word. They know it's a living word. They know it's an inspired word and they can talk about all the different terms that are used to explain what the word of God is, but sometimes they neglect it. And they're not as well rooted in the word of God as they should be. And then when life begins to fall apart, they can't recall to mind things that they should have known, things that they should have learned so that they can stand up Strong in the midst of the storm. You'll note the second word he uses is the term grounded. That's taken from the world of architecture. And it simply refers to the foundations upon which we build our lives. You know and I know, when you're building, if you don't get the foundations right, it's not good for the building, and the building's in trouble. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew 7, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. A child of God, many of us are on the road a long, long time. Some of us now just starting off. Some of us not too far down the Christian pathway. Let me say this to first of all encourage you and then to challenge you. Make sure that you get the foundation right. Make sure that you get into the word of God and be rooted and grounded in God's word. Because I'll tell you this, whenever the storms do come, and whenever the difficulties appear in our lives, and whenever situations come unexpectedly into our homes or into the lives of those whom we love, we're going to need the strengthening of the word of God to cope. We need to be able to turn to it and pull verses out of it that God has given to us that will encourage us to keep going. And that's not just true of the storms of life that come to us individually or collectively. Beloved, that's true about the world, the ever-changing world in which we live tonight. The fact is that we need to be rooted and grounded in the love of God and in the word of God. 
You see, there are storms going on around us today in the spiritual realm. Some of us aren't interested. I believe this, I believe that, and doesn't matter what's going on outside. Well, I can tell you this. What's going on outside tonight in certain parts of our world, a number of years down the line will be here in this part of God's vineyard. Of that, I have no doubt. For history has shown us that things have risen here and there and yonder, and within a period of time, they're sitting on our own doorsteps, and it's then when they come that we begin to say, what are we going to do? A church needs to know before these come where exactly they stand on the word of God. And I'm talking today about things like genderism, which is going to be a big problem in the church for years to come. I'm talking about sexuality. I'm talking about all these things that are aired continually in our world at this present time in order to suit a small minority and you and I need to be able to say, hold on. See this book, the Bible? Here's what it says. This is where I stand. You don't have to up on the roof shouting at the rooftops right across the world. You just need to be able to defend yourself, your position and what the word of God says in these ever changing days. And only a deep experience of God will enable us to cope. Only a relationship with God that is strong and intimate will enable us to cope. Remember what Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto life eternal. Beloved, do you know the moment we were saved that God's love was shed abroad in our hearts? If you and I learn to live with God and walk with God, you and I will understand what Paul means in Romans 5. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit given unto us. There's a time coming when we may not win people by arguments and we may have to stand and talk to them to buy the, from the scriptures. But here's another area of our Christian lives that can have an impact. When these lives of ours are permeated by the love of Christ. You see, what does that mean? But you see, whenever Paul says here about be rooted in love, when you and I are rooted in love and it begins to permeate our lives, you begin to love God more. You love Christ better. You love the people of God, their faults and all. And that love will overflow into a community that knows not Christ. That unfortunately isn't happening today. And yet the Bible reminds us about the love of God and about dimensions to that love that you and I will never, ever fathom. Paul says it passeth knowledge. Or as the little children's course, so high you can't get over it. Do you know what John Stott says of this love? The love of Christ is broad enough to encompass all mankind long enough to last for eternity, deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner and high enough to exalt him in heaven. Root yourself in the love of Christ. An unknown prisoner penned these words. Could we would think the oceans fill and where the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a, scri a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Paul says, listen, be rooted 
and grounded in love. I'm suggesting to you alongside that, especially in the days in which we live, we need to be rooted and grounded in the word. Firstly, he prays they might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Secondly, he prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Thirdly, he prays that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Here's the fourth thing. He prays this that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Think about that. He's praying for these believers, believers just like you and me. And he has dealt with the inner man and he has built and built and built until he gets to the stage, look, as God's children, Paul says it is possible for you to experience God's fullness in your life every single day. That's why he prayed that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. That word that is used in the Greek is a word that appears a number of times in the New Testament. It simply speaks about total fullness. In fact, the more literal translation says that you might be filled onto all the fullness of God. You say to me, Pastor, hold on a moment. Is that really possible? Well, I think if it wasn't possible, Paul wouldn't have prayed for them. Warren Wearsby says this. The means of our fullness is the Holy Spirit. And the measure of our fullness is God himself. Now, you and I know positionally we're complete in Christ. We notice that going through the book of Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10. Paul says, for in him, that is Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells. And ye are complete in him. But practically, we all need to be filled with all the fullness of God. Later on, Paul will develop this for us in Ephesians chapter 5, where he speaks about keeping in step with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and we'll be learning, God willing, in these three closing chapters, what it is to take the great theological things that Paul has spoken about, and then to apply them to our daily living. But I want to do something tonight when we're talking here about the fullness of the Spirit. There are many terms that are used in the New Testament to speak about the work and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And I want to mention these in passing because they're vitally important. Remember, firstly, there's the sealing of the Spirit. And we noted this when we were in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Speaking of Christ, Paul says this. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Let me simplify that very quickly. These believers had heard the word of truth through the gospel that had been preached to them. The truth of the gospel is simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Now these people were not only saved, but Paul was trying to help them to understand that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the Holy Spirit trusts every believer in Christ tonight. So when the gospels believe and Christ is trusted as Savior, the Holy Spirit seals the believer, and when he seals him, it cannot be unsealed. 
The sealing of the Spirit takes part or takes place when you and I are born again. An instantaneous act as is the new birth. And I said at the time, it signifies a finished work and it signifies eternal security. The Holy Spirit tonight is our guarantee that we will be kept until that great and glorious day when we shall be presented faultless in his presence. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Remember, secondly, that there is the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, that's one of the most important doctrines taught in the New Testament. It's one of the greatest, in my opinion, because it means that the Spirit of God has come to indwell every believing child of God. The Lord Jesus, when he was speaking about the Spirit of God to the disciples in John's Gospel, he said to them on one occasion that after he was gone, another comforter would come. So they knew that. But then Jesus extends that thought and he says to them that when the Holy Spirit does come, he is going to indwell the believer in Christ. During the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples, the Holy Spirit had not come yet in his fullness. That was not to happen until the advent of the Spirit of God and Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But Jesus says when the Spirit of God comes, he will abide in you. That's a wonderful truth, isn't it? He has come to stay, take up residence, use whatever term you want. Now you and I can quench the Spirit, and sometimes we do. And you and I can even grieve the Spirit and we sometimes do. But you cannot lose the Holy Spirit. You cannot lose because he comes into our hearts and he comes to stay. As the hymn writer says, he the mighty God indwells us, his to strength and help and power, his to overcome the tempter, ours to call in danger's hour. Here's the third thing. Remember that there is the baptism of the Spirit. And for many people, this is one of the most confusing doctrines of our day. In recent years, and I'm not talking about the last two or three years, I'm going back here a number of years where we have seen the rise of the charismatic movement. We have witnessed things like the Toronto Blessing, the Signs and Wonders Movement, and so many other groups that seem to appear from groups like that, when they seem to run their course, another group seems to break away with some new truth. And many Christians, good Christians, they're wondering what is right and what is wrong. And many are worrying in case they're losing out on what God has for them by a spirit. I remember counseling a young girl on one occasion who went with her friends, and they went to a meeting. And of course, at that particular meeting, all kinds of things were taking place that the little girl really didn't understand, for she wasn't on the way long enough to understand them. And then on the road home, they told her, because she didn't do what they could do, she was losing out on what God had for her by his spirit. You see, sometimes Christians today confuse this. They see the baptism of the Spirit as happening in two stages. They readily accept that the Holy Spirit can lead a man to repentance and to faith in Christ, and at that stage he is converted. But then at a later stage, they have a much fuller experience of Christ, and it's at this stage that they experience the baptism of the Spirit, that then leads to more spiritual power, a fuller Christian life, the bestowal of spiritual gifts, the most prominent being tongue-speaking and healing. 
But you see, in my understanding of the Scriptures, the baptism of the Spirit is seen to be identical with conversion. In other words, when a person repents of their sin, they trust Christ as their Savior, they're immediately baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit. All believers have experienced the same baptism at conversion when the Holy Spirit enters the believing sinner. Here's the fourth thing. What about the filling of the Spirit? When we speak about the filling of the Spirit, we're speaking of something that is happening within us. Now, we're not talking tonight about physical energy. We're not talking about activity in Christian things. See, I used to think as a young believer, and I ran with others to every meeting in the country, you know, people think you can be at meetings every night of the week. You can sit in any committee and every committee and be run of your feet. You attend this mission, that mission, right over the country, and you're seen as an outwardly active Christian. You can be seen outwardly to be an active Christian and yet know absolutely nothing about the filling of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we talk about the filling of the Spirit, you and I are talking about spiritual power within us. We're talking about spiritual power that shows itself operationally every single day of our lives. And the source of that power is the Holy Spirit himself. It's divine power. Working within and it is absolutely essential for spiritual growth. Now, there are many fillings of the Spirit. That's borne out by passages in the Word of God. It's not a one-off thing. And Paul says to these believers and to us, be constantly filled with the Spirit. But here he says this. This is a very important thing. He says that you and I are to be Filled with all the fullness of God. Who is God? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And beloved, when you and I are empowered and filled with the Spirit of God, we can know what Paul is speaking about here regarding the fullness of God's power in our lives. Fill us with thy holy fullness. God the Father, Spirit, Son, in us, through us, then forever, shall thy perfect will be done. For a believer to say tonight, I know nothing of the infilling. I don't think it's possible for me to experience the fullness. You're going against Scripture. Paul prays for these people that they might be Filled with all the fullness of God. The word of God tells us that you and I can be filled with the spirit of God. And there is so much power available to us that sometimes we know nothing about. Paul's attitude to prayer, Paul's request in prayer. Look at Paul's benediction in prayer because this is the last block of your lake where he brings everything together. Just give me a couple of minutes. He has dealt with various thoughts and themes, and now he bursts forth in adoration, and he says this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world, Without end, amen. 
Remember Paul did this in Ephesians 1. He used every word that he could in the vocabulary to describe the greatness and the vastness of God's power. And now he says, not only is God's power at work in us, and not only is God's power working through us, but he is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything we could ask or even dare to think. I love those words, he is able. Because there are so many things in my spiritual life I can't do. There are so many things in my ministry I don't have the resources for. I don't have the ability for. And I'm not able. But beloved, God is able. In fact, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything. We could ask or even dare to think. What am I saying? This. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Nothing. And you and I can do anything through Christ who gives us the strength so to do. And if we are living and walking in the power of the Spirit... You and I could do so much more than we think is imaginable in these puny lives of ours. The resources are there. The power is there. God is there. The fullness of God is available, but we'll never experience it until we are yielded to Christ. Why does Paul pray all of this? For this reason. That ultimately it will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the Christian's ultimate aim. Paul says unto him. Be the glory in the church. By Jesus Christ throughout all ages. World without end. Amen. God wants to be glorified in his church. And you know he will be when the church awakens and when every individual Christian empowered by the Holy Spirit moves forward at his command to do what God asks us to do. You see, Pastor, that's all fair and well. What should I do? about all of this. You should bow your head and heart and I should do the same when we go home tonight and pray it and absolutely mean it. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer thine. I take my heart, it is thine own, and it shall be thy royal throne. What a prayer that Paul makes. And it's a prayer tonight that we could and should make for each other. And would you grasp something of the theological implications and the practical implications? then we're ready now to step out to think about what that means for all of us as God's children. That's three, that's four, five, and six ahead. Let's pray together just for a moment. Father, these minds of ours are so limited at times. We just can't take it in, nor can we understand what it means to have the fullness of, of God. But Father, we long tonight that you would take these lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. So often we're just happy with the norm. So often we just plod along day by day, week by week, longing that maybe one of these days Jesus will either come or he'll take us home. 
And yet, our Father, there's so much work to be done. And there's so much power available to get it done. We pray tonight that we might know that experience of continually being filled with the Holy Spirit that these lives of ours rooted and grounded in the word of God will be able in a difficult day to stand up and be counted for Jesus. Help us, we pray, to be those kind of people for Christ our Saviour's sake. Amen.